Hi, I'm Jonathan Furman with the Michigan Depression Glass Society. I'd like to welcome you to our February 2021 virtual program. Tonight, our new member, Kevin Ryan, will be joining us to share his collection of wines and pairing them with my Heise Minuet. Now, the Minuet etching was produced by the Heise Glass Company between 1939 and 1956. And one of the things about this pattern, which is true of most glassware patterns, is when you go to a glass show or look on eBay, a lot of times people assume that this goblet here is a wine goblet, when in actuality it's a water, and this much smaller version here is the wine. So in modern day table settings, it can often be confusing for what wines you should serve in which glasses, considering wines have changed so much from the 30s. So tonight, Kevin is here with us, and he's gonna show us how to use the different stemware that I have with each appropriate wine. So welcome, Kevin. Hi, thanks so much for having me today. I titled my presentation, New Wine and Old Wine Skins, based off of the old biblical proverb. Um, but in fact, what I'd like to point out today is that you can put new wine in old wine glasses. And I'm a recent collector of depression glass. And one of the things that I noticed, um, being a sort of a wine connoisseur myself, is that none of the wine glasses or stemware at all really matched with um, our contemporary understandings of serving wine. Um, and for instance, uh, I'd like to point out the contemporary wine glass. And I think because the wine glass is so ubiquitous and we see it so often that we sort of fail to value um, both its beauty, simplicity, and its function. In fact, the modern wine glass is very functional. You'll notice that it has a wide foot to keep it from spilling, a nice stem, which separates the foot about a, maybe, I don't know, four or five inches there, and then a bulb which tapers, tapers towards the rim. The purpose of this uh, shape is that the bulb allows the wine that's in the glass to have maximum surface area that can interact with the oxygen in the air. Um, and then as it tapers towards the top, what this does is concentrates the aroma of the wine so that when you're drinking it, the aroma is concentrated to the nose. And as you know, we taste uh, with our nose as much as we do with our tongue. And so um, the modern wine glass is very versatile and very well designed to capture the optimal wine drinking experience. That's really interesting because if you compare it to this vintage glass here, if you hold them up, you'll see that yes, there's a pretty wide foot and a stem, but the, the flare is basically the opposite. We start out really wide here and get really narrow. Right, well, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that um, the wine culture in the United States really didn't take off until the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and so wine wasn't such a common part of the formal dining experience mm -hmm. in the 30s and 40s when depression glass was being made. Now, you pointed out that the the wine glass right. um, that's labeled wine is probably what, maybe a three ounce pour? Yeah, and you're definitely gonna need like a butler that evening to keep refilling everyone's wine glass yeah. if you're using those. Well, that's, and that's a problem. You know, certainly you, if you tried to serve a modern wine in a tiny wine glass like that, you'd be constantly refilling it. Um, and so uh, we had to work around that and we need to look at the complete line of uh, stemware that's available and what we can uh, do with that. So that's the, that's the topic of today's presentation. So that was a great overview of kind of the understanding of what a modern goblet is versus one of the vintage ones. So why don't we kind of move in talking about how to open a bottle of wine, how to store it, how to decant it, kind of those prep things before we even get ready for our dinner party. I get a lot of these questions from people who are new to wine. A lot of questions around how to store wine, temperature, and also decanting. So let's talk about those things. Mm -hmm. I always recommend storing a bottle of wine on its side, and it's for one very simple reason. The cork that's inside here in the neck of the bottle will dry out over time if it doesn't have that contact with the moisture in the bottle. And as the cork dries out, it shrinks, and then you lose the airtight seal. Now, in fact, I bet a lot of you have gone to a restaurant where they've opened a bottle in front of you, and what do they normally do? They give you the cork, okay? Here's why they give you the cork, or at least here's what you should do when you get the cork. You should check it to make sure that the end that was in the bottle is a nice red plum color. You can see that. Assuming it's a red wine, of course. Well, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you can see that this wine, this is from uh, Mackinac Trail Winery, um, it's nice and plum color, but that the wine hasn't run up the side of the cork. 
If you see that the wine has started to run up the side of the cork, that means that the cork at some point had dried out. You'd start to lose the seal and the wine was starting to run out of the bottle. So if you're at a restaurant and they serve you a wine and they put the cork on the table, that's what you should check. Just to make sure that the wine is contained only on one end and hasn't run up the cork. Now, uh, something cute that we've done here is mm -hmm. if, if you wanted to do that at your own dinner table or at a party and you wanted to show the cork, uh, as you would say, we have this little individual uh, sugar. Yep. And so um, this would just be a cute thing to have on the table and to open the bottle and have the cor cork and you can use that to hold the cork. Nice little display and you're not getting your linen tablecloth full of red wine without, you know, the first sip being poured. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> for sure. Um, so um, opening your bottle of wine, we have here um, a pretty standard wine opener. And what we've done is, again, just to keep the table um, uh, universal in its setting. We have this beautiful vase up here. Yep. That's um, one of the things I love to do is find different purposes for things. So I mean that's a minuet urn vase. It would have been used for flowers, but like any of the glassware, I mean just because something had an intended use doesn't mean you can't come up with a completely new use for it. Right, so we're using it just to hold the wine, uh, the wine opener. So we have the wine opener and the cork. Now let's talk about decanting. Um, a co common question is should I decant my wine? If it's a red wine, I almost always say yes. I think that any red wine will benefit from some decanting. Uh, the purpose of the decanter is to allow, again, sort of like our wine glass here with the bulb, to allow as much of the wine to interact with the oxygen in the air as possible. Um, you know, oxidation for wine is both our enemy and our friend. When you open a bottle of wine, you really want it to interact with the air because that's how you start to get the aroma. That's how the, the fruitiness and the supple flavors in the wine really come to life. If you open up a really nice bottle of red wine, for instance, a, a Barbera from Italy, and you drink it right away, it will taste completely different from straight out of the bottle mm -hmm. Or if you've decanted it for 40, even 50 minutes, it'll be a completely different wine, much more interesting, much more <clears throat> luscious and fruitful. Um, and in fact, you'll start to smell it right out of the decanter. So is that something we should plan for? I mean, you just said about 40, 50 minutes. Is that true of every wine about that amount of time? Yeah, I think, you know, if you're in a rush, 20 minutes is okay. Obviously, as the wine sits in the decanter over the course of the dinner, or even in your glass, it's going to continue to oxidize mm -hmm. to interact with the oxygen in the air. Um, but I think 20 minutes um, is a good round number if yeah. you're in a rush. Uh, if it's a big, luscious wine, like a Cabernet, or a Barolo, or a Bordeaux, um, you in an hour would be ideal. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about temperature. So I have one more question yeah. though about decanting. Yes. So you just said like an hour is ideal. Is there such a thing as too much decanting? Like I should not have opened this thing three hours before my dinner party, right? Yeah. So again, um, really you're going to be okay within the couple of hour time frame. The issue you'll run into is if it's a very old wine. Mm -hmm. If you've been aging a red wine for 20 to 30 years, it needs very little decanting okay. because it is a very, very fragile wine when it comes out of the bottle and should be drunk immediately. Okay. So yes, if you were aging a 30-year-old Bordeaux and you opened it, it should probably be consumed pretty quickly um, and you don't want to leave that out for a couple hours. Okay. So I have a couple examples here of decanters. Um, I don't think uh, there actually was ever one made in Minuet. So I have a Cambridge one here in a forest green color. Um, there's actually, in Depression Glass, actually made decanters here, so here's one in the Mayfair pattern by Hawking. And then one of the other ideas I thought was kind of cool, um, this is actually for um, a cordial, so you would, um, there's some little cordial glasses that would go with this, it was made by Cambridge. But my thought would be that if you didn't have a larger decanter, let's say you had a couple of these cordial bottles, it'd be kind of fun to put one of these at each place setting so everyone could have their own little decanted wine to pour along the rest of the evening. I agree. Um, and just as a side note, sometimes I'll get the question, do I need to decant a white wine? And the answer mm -hmm. is no. <laughs> uh, most white wines, uh, we're playing against time in terms of temperature. We want to keep our white wines cool, no warmer than 55 degrees. And so if you leave your white wine out in decanter, it's going to warm up much mm -hmm. quicker than if you leave it in the bottle, in the fridge, and then only pour it when you're ready. Um, in terms of temperature overall, I have a 20 minute rule. I like to throw a bottle of red wine from my shelf into the fridge 20 minutes before I open it. And for a white wine that's been in the fridge for a couple hours or a day or so, I like to pull it out 20 minutes before I serve it. Okay, so I have a question about that. Yes. So am I putting it in the fridge for 20 minutes 
and then decanting it, or should I decant it and then put it in the fridge? No, you don't want you don't want to put your decanter in the fridge. You don't want the um, aromas of your particular fridge to invade okay. the wine. So I Good think it, yes, twenty minutes twenty minutes in the fridge just to bring that temperature down to around sixty five degrees. Then decant it for twenty to forty to sixty minutes, depending on the wine type, and then serve it. Okay. And one of the other things I had here that I was curious about, so. Um, I, let's say if I didn't have a decanter and minuet, and I only had this water pitcher, which actually is a minuet pattern, mm -hmm. could I decant into something large like this? Yeah, absolutely. What's more important than the title of the, the vessel you're using is its shape. This water uh, pitcher would make an excellent decanter because of its shape. It's extremely bulbous, which means the cross section, the top of the wine, is going to have a lot of surface mm. area contact with the air, and also the nice wide open uh, top is going to allow a lot of interaction with the air as well. So this would make a perfectly fine decanter. I've also seen people use uh, vases that they've had around the home. Mm. As long as the shape is bulbous and you can have a lot of uh, contact with the top of the wine to the air. Okay. Well, we've been doing a lot of talking, and I feel that like there's wine here and we should be drinking. <laughs> sure. So I know you want to talk a little bit about uh, different sparkling beverages sure. here, and while you're doing that, I'm actually going to open one of them for Excellent. us. Excellent. Well, what he's open, opening is this lovely uh, sparkling rosé from Canada called Lola. Um, sparkling wine is very interesting because of its effervescence, and something that I noticed right away when I was collecting and learning about depression glasses, there are no fluted champagne uh, stems that I'm aware of. No, there are not. And this is actually a uh, standard stem here. This would be a champagne, uh, which was later rebranded as a tall sherbet during Prohibition. But that's typically what you'll see a sparkling beverage um, served in, at least in that era. So I like this idea of using the sherbet for this kind of effervescent wine. Um, sparkling rosé, something that's in the middle range of uh, bubbles, as you might say. Cheers. Okay, and we know, I, I, if you don't know this, you never, I would be mortified if everyone ever, anyone ever clicked my glasses together. So I, I prefer a, a cheers in the air and lift as opposed to, yes. you know, cleaning my glasses. Protect your glass, please. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Lovely. So I'm going to make a suggestion. Those of you that actually have juice glasses in your pattern, this is the closest glass that I've found, or the closest vessel shape to the fluted stem, and I think this would make an excellent champagne glass. If you have something that's very bubbly, like a true champagne um, or a Prosecco, for instance, something that is extremely effervescent and fizzy, I would really recommend trying and using your juice glass because of the height and the narrow, and that way you're going to see the bubbles um, rising towards the surface. You're really going to get um, the same experience as if you had a more traditional mm. fluted uh, champagne stem. I'll drink to that. Cheers. <laughs> okay, so after that, um, why don't we talk a little bit, um, I, you know, not everyone drinks wine, so I might have, um, you know, some pre-dinner cocktails like these sparkling wines, but for people who don't, um, we also have a couple of options here to talk about what you could do for maybe a margarita or a beer. Right. For the, the non-wine drinkers, you still want to include them in your uh, dinner service, and you want them to feel included also with the depression glass pattern or the etching that you're using. So uh, Jonathan had a great idea of using the uh, shrimp cocktail mm -hmm. as a uh, margarita glass, and it would, also, it would be great for that. It's a great shape. Um, almost looks like a classic margarita glass in a way, very wide and a little bit shallow. And so that way they can feel included here. And also for the beer drinkers, we're using our standard tumbler as our beer glass, which would be perfect, honestly. This would make a great beer glass because of its shape and size. Great. So now we want to talk a little bit about the different wine pairings, but first I thought we could maybe touch on when we're setting our table setting here. Mm -hmm. We have an example here of just a single place setting with a couple different stems. Um, so what, what's, well, I know we're going to talk a little bit about which is appropriate for red versus white, but sure. can you just walk us through kind of um, how we set up this particular place setting here and uh, the order of the goblets? Right. So for a formal dining experience, really you want a minimum of three glasses. Um, and what we have here are three uh, different kinds of stems. We have a nice tea glass, which we are using as our water glass. Closest to me, the tall glass here is a tall water, but we'll use it as our red wine. 
and then the uh, short water we're using for white wine. So again, really more important maybe than even the shapes of the glasses, but just to be considered that you have three different um, vessels, a white wine, which would be closest to the diner, and then a little further away will be the red, and then the water at the top of the dish. And what's the other glass here? Okay, so we might not have um, these specific glasses. We might not have large, a large assortment of the large goblets or the large water glasses or even the iced tea glasses. And so we might want to or need to serve our wine in a smaller glass. Um, this is the cocktail glass, I believe, um, which is about, it looks like it's about a four, three and a half, four ounce uh, pour here. Um, and to avoid the issue that we talked about earlier of having to refill their glass every five minutes, um, I have a little trick here. You can find these individual wine carafes or um, cruets pretty much anywhere nowadays. Mm. And you could have this as part of the table setting and fill this glass with the wine and then they can choose to refill their glass at their own discretion. Um, this one is actually really fun. It has two etched lines, one for a five ounce pour and one for a six ounce pour, which is really helpful if you're partitioning with six different, uh, five or six different people with mm -hmm. one bottle of wine, you can really make sure that you get a nice even um, amount of wine per guest. Great. Then we have here just another example of that iced tea glass. We're using a San Pellegrino um, sparkling water. Yeah. And then why don't we talk about some of the other whites versus reds and what those glasses are used for each wine. Sure. Well, as Jonathan mentioned, um, the glass that most resembles the modern wine stem is the tall water. Do you mind holding that for sure. us? So again, you see the nice wide foot, so it's stable on the table. You have the beautiful stem. And then uh, on top, you have the actual uh, vessel for holding the liquid. Um, and so if you have this glass, I highly encourage you to try using it for red wine. Uh, particularly because of its shape, and it is one of the larger depression glass uh, stems, to use it for your big reds. And when I mean big red, I'm talking about the bold, the Cabernets, the Bordeaux, the Burgundies. If you're in Italy, you're talking about the Barolos and the Barbarescos. If you're in Spain, uh, Tempranillo, the, the very rich, earthy, big, deep wines will really benefit, again, from having that large shape so that it can interact with the air and also so that it, the glass can collect the aroma and uh, you can smell it as you're drinking it. Great. Uh, over here, uh, we have the low water, which I'm going to suggest if you happen to have all of these, this assortment of stemware, that you might consider using that as your white wine glass. Okay. With the white wine, it's not quite so important that you're that um, uh, you're not touching the glasses often, uh, like with a red wine glass. So the fact that your guests are going to be touching it um, and making more contact with the actual uh, bowl of the glass isn't so much such a big deal. And it will also contrast nicely with the red wine. I know sometimes in modern table settings, the white wine glass and the red glass can look very similar. Right. And the difference in heights will be a very clear indicator to the guest. Ah, this is the white, and then the tall is for the red. If you only have one of those, um, or two, two different stems, and you happen to have the uh, cocktail glass, uh, you could definitely get away with one of the lighter, serving one of the lighter red wines in here. Something that doesn't that isn't quite so bold and forward. Mm. For instance, I have here um, a beautiful uh, Beaujolais, which is a, uh, from the Gamay grape. Beaujolais and Gamay, it's a lighter red wine, very dry, but also very fruity. Um, also, I could see you using a Pinot Noir or uh, a Barbera. Um, one of the lighter reds might benefit nicely um, and be fine in one of the smaller glasses that's about this size. Okay, so we've learned about how we should decant our line, we've had our cocktails, we've had our various courses with our dinner here. Uh, let's move on to some dessert wines and some after dinner drinks. Uh, so what do we have down here? So I think it's really fun and important when you're having a nice large formal dinner that you uh, experiment with dessert wines or an aperitif. And this is where we really get to have fun with the tiny little stemware glasses that we don't normally get to play with. Uh, for instance, little, yeah. Just for size comparison here, let's let's 
There we are. <laughs> you're getting one ounce. So it's not something that you want, I mean, it, you, it's something strong, so you're not gonna want a lot of it. Right, exactly. So for instance, a personal recommendation of mine would be to use a sauterne as an aperitif. Aperitif meaning something to enjoy before the dinner is served. Right here, I have a French sauterne. It's a six year age sauterne. It's very, very sweet, absolutely delicious, served chilled. Uh, before dinner to sort of awaken the palate. It would be excellent in our small little cordial glass because you're only gonna, your guests are only going to want a few sips just to enjoy um, and mm -hmm. any more of that would be just be too sweet and too much. So this would be a perfect little glass to, to use um, at the, as the very first course, uh, your little aperitif, your sauter. And we actually have another glass here set by those. This is actually the wine glass, if you can believe it. I think it's three ounces, maybe two and a half. Maybe. Not a lot. So what are we using this one for? So I really like this glass for um, your digestif. So okay. if you were going to have something that was more after dinner and, and comfortable to drink. Um, like the Amaro. Over so there. for yeah, even Amaro, we have a cherry port over here. Um, and we have, in fact, we have a bourbon cream as well. That would be beautiful served in the wine glass mm -hmm. um, where it's not so tiny um, as the cordial. There's a little bit more substance in there, um, but it's still small and delicate and really lovely to hold uh, and to sip with uh, after your dinner is concluded. And then we actually have two more stems we have not talked about yet, which yes. I'm excited for. So I'm going to hold these up here. So we have a low sherbet, and then I know we did not make a official oyster cocktail because I don't think in today's modern times people want to really shoot a raw oyster. It seems like it's gone a little bit out of style, but we have found a new use for this tonight. Yeah, I was really excited because I figured that of all the stems on here, the one that's probably used the least is the is oyster. The oyster. And mm -hmm. I wanted us to come up with um, something that we could do um, with the low oyster, low oyster. And I think we've come up with a really fun recipe, yeah. um, which we need to go and uh, get the ice cream out of the fridge so it can soften. And so we will come back and show you how to make uh, Kevin's Sherry Affogato. That sounds delicious. So we're back with Kevin's Sherry Affogato. So Kevin, I know there's different types of sherry. There's like a sweet sherry, a dry sherry. Can you tell us like what sherry even is and what the different kinds are and how, what the one is we have today? So sherry is a Spanish uh, dessert wine and it's one of my absolute favorites. I think it's absolutely delicious in all its forms. And you're right, there are several forms of sherry. There's a dry sherry, which is really good for cooking. There's a, a, an off dry or a semi dry, which is good for sipping as well. There's a sweet sherry. You'll also see uh, the word cream sherry used. That's an, uh, that means a sweet sherry. So if you see a cream sherry, it's a sweet sherry. Also good for uh, a after dinner dessert wine. And then there is uh, this bottle right here, which is uh, a Pedro Jimenez. Pedro Jimenez is considered the sweetest of all the wines. It is a grape, uh, it originates in Spain, and it is extremely, extremely sweet, but it is so delicious. You will definitely want to serve this chilled. You could absolutely use it on its own as an after dinner beverage, in which case I would probably end up using the wine or the cordial. Um, but uh, one of my favorite desserts is a sherry affogato. Most of you might know that an affogato is a shot of espresso over ice cream, but this is absolutely delicious over vanilla ice cream. And so as a really fun interactive dessert with your guests, I would like to suggest that you would pour about one and a half to two mm -hmm. ounces of the sherry in the oyster glass. And then in the low sherbet, we put some vanilla ice cream. You would serve them separately and then allow your guests to pour the amount of sherry that they would like over the ice cream and to enjoy it. Well, I am definitely gonna enjoy this right now. I grabbed a spoon from over there. It's absolutely okay. delicious. Um, yeah. Mm. So good. Yeah. It's, so that, that's a fun, a fun way to conclude your evening with a dessert. It has that nice, um, I mean, very, it almost tastes like a raisin. I mean, yeah. A raisin syrup. Exactly. It's super like caramelized raisin flavor, very intense, very sweet, very viscous, but absolutely perfect served um, over some ice cream. I, I know people who serve it over chocolate ice cream and say it's equally as delicious. So uh, I hope you will give that a try at your next party um, and give you an opportunity to actually use that oyster 
uh, for something fun. Yes, other than a raw oyster, which I don't <laughs> right. think any of your guests are really going to be that pleased with. Right. So, <laughs> thank you so much, Kevin, for doing this presentation yeah, as a new pleasure. member of the club. And I think the biggest thing that we'd like to kind of get across today is that these are some suggestions of how you could use your stemware for reds and whites and things like that. But the most important thing of all is to really just get out your glass and use it. Um, set a table, enjoy yourselves, have some friends over. If you follow these recommendations, great, but if not, and you just have a great red wine and a pretty glass, at the end of the day, that's all that matters, and it makes it all the more memorable to have that wine in a beautiful goblet. So, thank you again, Kevin. Absolutely. Cheers. Welcome to the club. Cheers. And we hope to have another presentation from you soon. Thank you. Enjoy your wine.